Good evening. This is Joshua Bowen with a breaking story about the book of Daniel. We have confirmed reports that some of the historical information in the book might not be accurate. Okay, so it's not breaking news. In fact, this has been known for quite some time. When we try to figure out when the book of Daniel was written, we look at things like its historical accuracy, when it gets things wrong, and when it gets things right. In this video, we will look at the problems with the dates that are given in the book, as well as the problems with the history involving Nebuchadnezzar, the second king that ruled over Babylon during the Neo-Babylonian period, as well as Belshazzar, who was co-regent for a period of time with his father, Nabonidus. Like, subscribe, come along for the ride. We've got a lot to cover today with some of the specific historical problems in Daniel. Before we get started, I think it would be a good idea to quote Lester Grob, an Old Testament scholar, concerning the fundamentalist defense of the biblical texts. Fundamentalism has already determined its conclusions. It is not seeking because it already knows the answer. If it has good evidence on its side which supports the Bible, it uses it. If it has little data, it twists and interprets what it has to support the Bible. If it has no evidence, it hypothesizes that such will eventually be found. And of course, no amount of contrary evidence is sufficient. Fundamentalism can never conclude that the Bible is wrong. Grob's point here is that when one begins with a conclusion that they must reach, the evidence can inevitably be twisted or construed in such a way as to render the desired conclusion at least possible. Unfortunately, that is not how historiography is done. We must go where the evidence leads us and determine what is most likely to be the case and not defend what we want or need to be true simply because it is possible. If a detective were to identify a suspect in a murder investigation, chase down that lead, only to find that the suspect had a strong alibi, no motive, and no means to commit the crime, he should likely begin looking for another suspect. Then another suspect is identified. If the detective, in spite of positive evidence pointing to the second suspect as the killer, continued to develop possible scenarios in which the first suspect could have possibly committed the crime, this would likely get them removed from the case. The same is true in historiography. This point will come up time and again in this video, beginning with the dates given in the book. In Daniel 1, 1-2, we run into our first series of problems with the historical data. Some of these problems are easier to reconcile than others. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles of the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. There are several difficulties in these verses. Some of these are easier to possibly reconcile than others. For example, the setting is Jehoiakim's third year, or 606 BCE. However, at that time, Nebuchadnezzar was not in the region, and Jehoiakim was a vassal of Pharaoh Necho II of Egypt. In fact, Nebuchadnezzar did not even become king until 605 BCE, after the death of his father Nabopolassar. Now, some of these problems can potentially be reconciled. For instance, even though Nebuchadnezzar was not king at the time, this could be a proleptic use of the title. We see this in Jeremiah 46.2, for example. This is the message against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt, which was defeated at Carchemish on the Euphrates River by Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, son of Josiah, king of Judah. We know that Nebuchadnezzar was not king at the Battle of Carchemish. This is simply an example of the writer projecting the title back. 
Does that mean that this is definitely what is happening in Daniel? No, but it is easy to understand how this could be the case. With some of these issues, it is easier to find possible reconciliations. However, we will focus here on one of the more difficult problems in the text, the supposed siege of Jerusalem. Daniel 1, 1 1-2 states that Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem, and the Lord delivered the king of Judah, Jehoiakim, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Nebuchadnezzar then plundered the temple and took some of the vessels back to Babylon. Two passages outside of Daniel are often cited in this discussion, 2 Kings 24 and 2 Chronicles 36. During Jehoiakim's reign, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, invaded the land, and Jehoiakim became his vassal for three years. But then he turned against Nebuchadnezzar and rebelled. In 605, Nebuchadnezzar defeated Pharaoh Necho II at the Battle of Carchemish and campaigned in the region of Hamath, or Syria-Palestine. Kogan and Tadmor comment, The year 605, the third year of Jehoiakim, was the year of the Battle of Carchemish. Nebuchadnezzar reached the land of Hamath, but not Jerusalem. He reached Judah at the earliest in 604, Jehoiakim's fourth year. Thus, according to 2 Kings 24, Jehoiakim became Nebuchadnezzar's vassal most likely in 604, but at the earliest in 605. In 2 Chronicles 36, we see, Jehoiakim was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord his God. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, attacked him and bound him with bronze shackles to take him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also took to Babylon articles from the temple of the Lord and put them in his temple there. Yafet writes, The specific phrasing of Chronicles, to take him, should be explained as denoting actual deportation. It is difficult to see how the passage in Chronicles can be separated from the parallel tradition of Daniel 1-2, which states clearly that Nebuchadnezzar brought Jehoiakim to Babylon. Thus, one historical tradition is seen in 2 Kings 24, while another appears in 2 Chronicles 36 and Daniel 1, 1-2. Yavid concludes, The unavoidable conclusion seems to be that 2 Kings 24, 1-6 and the chronicler's view are not complementary, but deliberately exclusive, expressing alternative views of the fortunes of king and land at the time. Similarly, Kogan and Tadmor write, The item in Daniel 1, 1 1-2, that in Jehoiakim's third year Nebuchadnezzar despoiled the temple and exiled some Judeans, often cited in this connection, cannot be used for historical purposes. The book of Daniel is not on par with 2 Kings and the Babylonian Chronicle, like the third day, the third month, or the third year. One should consider the possibility that the tradition in Daniel 1, 1 1-2 derives ultimately from the text of 2 Chronicles 36, 6. Wiseman concluded that the siege spoken of in Daniel 1, 1 1-2 is not mentioned in the Babylonian Chronicle because the text is focused on the defeat of Egypt. However, the Chronicle does describe a siege against Judah in Nebuchadnezzar's seventh year. In the month of Kislev, the king of Akkad mustered his army and marched to Hatu. He encamped against the city of Judah, and on the second day of the month, Adar, he captured the city and seized its king. A king of his own choice he appointed in the city, and taking the vast tribute, he brought it into Babylon. Furthermore, the narrative describes Jehoiakim's son, Jehoiachin, as described in 2 Kings 24, 10-15. At that time, the officers of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came up to the city while his officers were besieging it. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles, and his officials all surrendered to him. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. As the Lord had declared, 
Nebuchadnezzar removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and from the royal palace, and cut up the gold articles that Solomon, king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. He carried all Jerusalem into exile. All the officers and fighting men, and all the skilled workers and artisans, a total of ten thousand. Only the poorest people of the land were left. Nebuchadnezzar took Jehoiachin captive to Babylon. In light of the more serious or seemingly irreconcilable discrepancies, there may be a more appropriate solution. Golden Gay summarizes concerning many of these historical issues in Daniel 1, 1 1-2. Danielic dates cluster in the first three years of a king's reign, and perhaps affirm God's lordship at key transition points in history. First or third can be merely concrete ways of saying, at the beginning, or not long after the beginning. Thus, the date probably makes a more than merely historical point. Sayal comes to a similar conclusion. The stories in the book of Daniel are set in the context of Israel's defeat and subsequent exile. The details of that historical setting are, however, difficult to coordinate with other biblical passages and extra-biblical sources for a number of reasons. Such discrepancies prompted the 3rd century philosopher Porphyry and his intellectual successors to question the historical veracity of the book altogether, while apologists, both ancient and modern, have proffered various ways to harmonize the data. The notice in verses 1-2 to two appears, however, to be merely a telescoping of various events that led up to the eventual dispersion of the Israelites in the 6th century. In any case, the notice serves its purpose well by providing a narrative setting to tell the stories of individuals who are trying to live out their convictions in a world dominated by those who do not share their faith. The madness of Nebuchadnezzar is another difficult event to reconcile with what we know of the historical period. In Daniel 4, Nebuchadnezzar is apparently writing in the first person, declaring what God had done to him and his resultant conversion to the worship of the Most High God. Because of the king's hubris, he was driven away from people to live with the wild animals. This situation would continue for seven years, until you, Nebuchadnezzar, acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Several things stand out about this passage that lead us to believe that this is not only unhistorical, but is not even about Nebuchadnezzar. Rather, it is about Nabonidus, the final king of the Neo-Babylonian Empire. First, one would expect to find something in the historical record concerning a seven-year absence of the king, as we do, for example, with Nabonidus. With the king gone, the Akitu festival would not have been able to be carried out, as we saw with Nabonidus. Of course, there is a common apologetic argument to explain this lack of historical data for such a hiatus. Longman, in his commentary on Daniel, writes, it is probably unwise to make much out of the silence of the extra-biblical texts, since the king's reign is not exhaustively documented, and it is not the type of thing that Nebuchadnezzar may have wanted preserved for perpetuity in his royal inscriptions. It is true that his reign is not thoroughly documented in a detailed historical fashion, but is it reasonable to conclude that this would not be found somewhere in the textual evidence? Would not Nebuchadnezzar have wanted such a thing documented in his inscriptions, or in royal proclamations of any kind? Look at how the story begins. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. Or consider Daniel 4, 34-37. At the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes toward heaven, and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High, I honored and glorified Him who lives forever. His dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as He pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, What have you done? 
At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor were restored to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out, and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the King of Heaven, because everything he does is right, and all his ways are just, and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. We would have to conclude that, following such a drastic turn of events in the king's life, and the immense change that resulted from his punishment and subsequent restoration, that Nebuchadnezzar immediately changed his mind about the God of heaven, and worked to remove any evidence for his seven-year absence, conversion, and proclamations. Not only does this seem highly improbable, but it also goes directly against the nature of the text. The point of the passage is that God, through his power, changed the heart of even the most powerful and arrogant of kings. It would be counter to the text to conclude that God's efforts were so completely ephemeral as to be forgotten as soon as they had taken effect. It is also incredibly suspicious that the prayer of Nebuchadnezzar seems to contain similar characteristics to those found in the text of the Hebrew Bible. Hartman and Delella write, The Nebuchadnezzar of this narrative speaks and acts as a pious Jew, who is quite familiar with the Old Testament rubrics and forms of prayer. Notice the similarities between the prayer of Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 and parallel phrases in the Psalms and Isaiah, as presented in this chart found in Hartman and Delella's commentary on Daniel. Thus, there is strong evidence against the historicity of this account with respect to Nebuchadnezzar. While scholars would not argue that the events are accurate, it has become clear that the book of Daniel has followed an erroneous tradition in several places, attributing characteristics of one historical figure to another. Here, Nebuchadnezzar has been confused with Nabonidus. Boyeu writes, the figure of Nabonidus emerges most clearly in Daniel 4 and 5. It is now generally accepted that the story of Nebuchadnezzar's madness and his expulsion among beasts originates in a recollection of Nabonidus' eccentric behavior, especially regarding religious issues, and of his withdrawal to the North Arabian oasis of Tema. As we will see later in this video, Daniel presents Belshazzar as the son of Nebuchadnezzar, although we know that he was the son of Nabonidus. While apologetic arguments are made to show how this could possibly be so, although they admit it is simply speculation, there is a far easier solution that fits well with the data that we have. Traditions and facts about Nabonidus were incorrectly attributed to Nebuchadnezzar. One of the texts that solidified this interpretation came to light in the discovery of the Qumran text, The Prayer of Nabonidus. Although somewhat fragmentary, it clearly demonstrates that the tradition was not to be attributed to Nebuchadnezzar, but to Nabonidus. The words of the prayer uttered by Nabonai, king of the land of Babylon, the great king, when he was afflicted with an evil ulcer in Taman by decree of the Most High God. I was afflicted with an evil ulcer for seven years, and an exorcist pardoned my sins. He was a Jew from among the children of the exile of Judah. And he said, Recount this in writing to glorify and exalt the name of the Most High God. And I wrote this, I was afflicted with an evil ulcer in Taman, by decree of the Most High God. For seven years I prayed to the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone and clay, because I believed that they were gods. Carol Newsom summarizes this discussion well in her 2014 commentary on Daniel. Already in the 20th century, on the basis of new cuneiform documents from Mesopotamia, scholars had proposed that behind Daniel 4 was a story originally told about Nabonidus, and only subsequently reconfigured as a narrative about Nebuchadnezzar. It was recognized that Belshazzar was the son, not of Nebuchadnezzar, but of Nabonidus. Moreover, Nabonidus was absent from Babylon for a period of 10 years, in the Arabian desert oasis of Tema and he was the object of harsh polemics from the priests of Marduk in Babylon because of his advocacy of the supremacy of the moon god Sin. 
He was also, uniquely among Neo-Babylonian monarchs, known for his interest in revelatory dreams. Most significant, however, was the 1956 discovery of the Haran inscriptions by Nabonidus and his mother, Adad Gupi, in Haran in northern Mesopotamia. One of these inscriptions, Haran II, A and B, exhibits striking similarities with the structure and narrative details of Daniel 4. That there was a tradition of Jewish storytelling about Nabonidus was confirmed by the discovery of the prayer of Nabonidus among the Dead Sea Scrolls. In first-person style, this fragmentary Aramaic text relates how Nabonidus suffered from a serious ailment for seven years in Tema, praying unsuccessfully for relief from idols. He was, however, healed by the Most High God. Despite the numerous features in this text similar to the narration of Daniel 4, there are enough differences to indicate that neither story was a direct source for the other. Both, however, draw on a common stock of traditions about Nabonidus. Bouillou concurs, The discovery of the prayer of Nabonidus among the Qumran manuscripts shows that even after the compilation of Daniel in the first decades of the second century, there continued a parallel tradition that correctly ascribed to the historical Nabonidus the episodes of the royal disease and the residence in the oasis of Tema. In other words, Daniel 4 contains a narrative that, when applied to Nebuchadnezzar, presents numerous historical problems. However, when we recognize that the story goes back to a common tradition associated with Nabonidus, and need not be historically inerrant, as this was not the purpose of the text, these issues are no longer problematic. It is very interesting to note that, in the prayer of Nabonidus, he references making prayers to the, quote, gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone and clay. While in Daniel 5, 4, and 23, Belshazzar praises, quote, the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. This appears to further connect these two narratives to a common tradition. Thus, it is almost certain that stories about Nabonidus were incorrectly attributed to Nebuchadnezzar. This understanding also helps us with our next issue, Belshazzar. If you have looked into the dating of the book of Daniel, you have probably run into this argument. It goes something like this. Daniel got it wrong. Look, it says that Belshazzar was the king and the son of Nebuchadnezzar, but he wasn't. He was just a co-regent and he was the son of Nabonidus. Uh, yeah, well, you guys didn't even think that uh, Belshazzar existed before, and then we proved you wrong. So, who cares? It still doesn't make Belshazzar the king or Nebuchadnezzar's son. Uh, well, duh. Okay. Okay. Uh, they could have just been using the word king loosely, okay, uh, since he was mostly acting as the king. And don't you know Hebrew? The word father can mean grandfather or, or even great-grandfather. How does that help you? You're saying that Daniel used an incorrect term to refer to Belshazzar. And Nebuchadnezzar wasn't Belshazzar's grandfather either. Nabonidus was a usurper. He wasn't part of Nebuchadnezzar's dynasty. And it shows how much you know, okay? Um, we know that one of the other kings uh, married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, uh, and that uh, Nabonidus might have married one too, okay? Uh, so Nebuchadnezzar was Belshazzar's grandfather. <laughs> Booyah! Okay, so that's a little contrived, or not. The point is that Belshazzar is a common point of contention in this debate. What we want to do here is dig down and get to the bottom of this back and forth. What evidence do we actually have? Now, it is true that the words father and son can be used in Hebrew and Aramaic, and in wider Semitic, to indicate father and son, as in English, or as a more distant descendant or progenitor. Seau writes, In the Semitic languages, father is not limited to that of a biological or even adoptive parent. The term may be used simply of an ancestor or a progenitor. By the same token, the term son is used of a descendant, a successor, or simply a member of a group or class. Perhaps to the narrator, Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar both belong to the same family of arrogant Chaldean oppressors. The father-son language serves to link the two kings. 
the one who took the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem with the one who desacralized them. Thus, if one is going to argue that the writer got it right, it is possible that this sort of group association is what is intended. The idea that Nebuchadnezzar was in fact the biological grandfather of Belshazzar was suggested by Alan Millard in his 1977 article, Daniel 1-6 through and History, in the journal Evangelical Quarterly. The article presents arguments and suggestions for possible explanations for the problems seen in the early chapters of the book of Daniel. Concerning the issue of Belshazzar's lineage, Millard writes, As a speculation, it may be suggested that Nabonidus too was a son-in-law of Nebuchadnezzar, putting him in as good a place to take the throne as Nereglisser. Then the mother of Belshazzar would have been a daughter of Nebuchadnezzar. But this remains speculation until more evidence is available. A similar argument is made by Wiseman, who references Millard's article. Nothing is yet known of Nabonidus' wife, so that it is not impossible that she was another daughter of Nebuchadnezzar, who married Nabonidus, who was already of high rank, a Lutu Lugal, in Nebuchadnezzar's eighth year. Both Millard's and Wiseman's suggestions, therefore, are based on the idea that, because Nereglisser married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, and because Nabonidus was likely a high-ranking official at the palace of Babylon, that Nabonidus may have married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters. Herodotus mentions Cyrus' march against the son of Nitocris. Daugherty understood this Nitocris to be the wife of Nabonidus. However, Boyu rejects this reconstruction. Therefore, if we assume that the meaning of father and son is grandfather and grandson, and that Nabonidus married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, something for which we lack any evidence, then this passage would make more sense historically. Here is what we are left with. There is strong evidence that the traditions concerning Nabonidus were incorrectly transferred to Nebuchadnezzar, perhaps because he was the one who took the vessels from the temple in Jerusalem. This would connect him to Belshazzar, the father who took the vessels and the son who used them in a profane way. As we will see in our discussion of Darius the Mede, the writer of Daniel has a tendency to make these kinds of transfers to characters in the book. Thus, son and father would be read in their standard fashion, as Nabonidus was actually Belshazzar's father. If we wish to interpret the claim of lineage to be historically accurate, we either have to interpret the text to indicate inclusion in a group, as Seau, or assume that grandfather and grandson are meant, and that Nabonidus, who is oddly not mentioned in the text, married one of Nebuchadnezzar's daughters, a possibility that is mere speculation. It is also very problematic that, according to Daniel, Belshazzar is on the throne when the Neo-Babylonian Empire falls. In fact, we know for certain that Nabonidus had returned from Tema in his 13th regnal year. Furthermore, Boeus surmises, based on the textual evidence from the end of Nabonidus' reign, that Belshazzar was most likely stationed outside of Babylonia after Nabonidus' return. Three archival texts that come from Nabonidus' 14th year refer to Belshazzar. Two of the three archival texts yield more information as to the role of Belshazzar after Nabonidus' return. Both are lists of travel equipment, such as garments, shoes, and foodstuffs, allotted to various individuals who are dispatched to the son of the king. So, not only had Nabonidus returned several years before the fall of Babylon, but Belshazzar, whom Daniel presents as the king ruling in Babylon at the time of its defeat, was most likely not even in Babylonia at the time of its fall to Cyrus. Boyeux writes, It is unfortunate that these texts do not record where Belshazzar was stationed when these provisions were sent to him. A likely place would be Dor Karashu, where he was based at the beginning of the ninth year, when Cyrus crossed the Tigris to march to Anatolia. But the mention of travel provisions suggests that Belshazzar was a significant distance from Sippar, and since he never appears in any archival text after the middle of the 13th year, one may even venture that he was permanently stationed outside Babylonia. This may indicate that he was put in charge of the defense of the kingdom by Nabonidus, 
and that he was moving with the army along the eastern and northern borders of Mesopotamia and Syria. He concludes, In any case, Belshazzar does not appear in archival texts from the period under consideration, which suggests that he was released from his official responsibilities as regent and perhaps stationed in a place outside Babylonia. This makes Daniel 5.30 incredibly difficult to reconcile with the textual evidence. That very night, Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. If Belshazzar was not even in Babylon, and most likely quite far away, how could he be present to have a feast and to be killed as the ruling king? Lester Grob points out another very problematic aspect of this passage. Daniel 5.30 says, That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed. It is now known that Babylon was taken by the Persian army without a fight. One might still argue that perhaps Belshazzar alone resisted or that he was assassinated. Unlikely, but perhaps possible. Bayou's study came out two years after Grob's article was published. But there is clear evidence that Belshazzar almost certainly did not die at this time. The Nabonidus Chronicle, a rather reliable source from this period, was edited by Grayson, where he wrote, The authors have included all Babylonian kings known to have ruled in this period, and there is no evidence that they have omitted any important events which have a bearing on Babylonia during their reigns. Every significant event known in the period from sources other than the Chronicles, which affects Babylonia, is referred to in the Chronicle. Not only do we have good evidence that Belshazzar was probably not even in Babylonia, and that Babylon fell without a fight, but the Chronicle, a rather reliable source, notes that Nabonidus retreated before Cyrus following the fall of Sippar. Cyrus entered Babylon without a fight, and Nabonidus was subsequently captured there. If the Chronicle describes the events surrounding these kings without omitting any important events which have a bearing on Babylonia during their reigns, and Belshazzar, the crown prince, is not mentioned, much less described as killed, and Cyrus, while taking the city of Babylon without a fight, captured Nabonidus as prisoner, it seems highly improbable that the Chronicle would leave out the significant detail of the death of the crown prince. And while we must be cautious in using sources like Barosis, Grab notes confirmation of the narrative described in the Nabonidus Chronicle. Barosis, whose account of the fall of Babylon is extant, says nothing about the death of the king's son. On the other hand, he does state that Nabonidus, after first fleeing, decided to surrender to Cyrus, who treated him well and let him settle in Carmania. The gracious treatment of conquered rulers was a general characteristic of Persian rulers, Nabonidus being no exception. He concludes, but if Nabonidus was treated well, why should Belshazzar have been killed? And if he had been killed, a particularly notable event for the reasons already indicated, why would both Barosis and the Chronicle be silent on the matter? In sum, the current state of our information is overwhelmingly against the historicity of Daniel 5.30 as it stands. Okay, a lot of information about Belshazzar. Let's sum up. 1. Whether father or son can mean grandfather or grandson in this context is somewhat irrelevant. 2. Daniel tends to transfer characteristics or events of historical figures upon characters in the text, and the evidence strongly suggests that the stories about Nebuchadnezzar are actually part of the Nabonidus tradition. 3. Thus, the reference to Nebuchadnezzar as Belshazzar's father is most simply explained by understanding the tradition to be about Nabonidus who was, in fact, Belshazzar's father. 4. Nabonidus returned to Babylon in his 13th regnal year, after which time Belshazzar was no longer present in Babylon, but was likely sent off some distance from Babylon, no longer functioning as co-regent. 5. Babylon fell in Nabonidus' 17th year to Cyrus, who took the city without a fight. Nabonidus fled, but was captured or surrendered in Babylon, and was likely treated well by Cyrus. 6. Because no source, particularly the Nabonidus Chronicle, mentions Belshazzar's death, and he was possibly not even in Babylonia at the time, 
the events described in Daniel 5 are almost certainly not historical. Whew. Okay, we are just about done. In our next and final video, we will look at the infamous figure known from Daniel, Darius the Mede. We'll also take a look at what Daniel got right historically, and how that helps scholars date the book. We can also talk about the genre of the text, and how that helps us understand why someone in the second century would write the book of Daniel the way they did. So, until next time, resist poor scholarship. Always ask, how do you know that? <laughs>